Hamburg as, um, as a projectionist, lip sync operator, and um, being at the studios is such an exciting point in time. Hello, Peter. Hello. And I also was a special effects assistant. Of course. And, yeah. and then my hands were also featured many times in, in, a, in a series. So this hand, actually, this lady Penelope's hand, which was holding a, a glass of Pen um, Perno. Is it Perno? Yes, yeah, it was a Penelope. Uh, and and, and um, uh, the cameraman, Alan Perry, had, a, a, had an air pistol aimed at the glass, and he was actually, I, I was like terrified, right? Had that, had that glove on, you know, so that you wouldn't know it was my hand, really, you know. But, uh, and then he shot it, and then that's, that's basically, that, you know, that's my claim to fame. Uh, well, if that, that doesn't require a round of applause, then I don't know what Yeah. But my, this hand also used to uh, catch alligators. So when the alligators went <laughs> off the island, it was my job, you know, I had a, sort of a rubber suit on to get into the tank and try and find the alligator underneath. So I'd be waving at the alligator with one hand and then grabbing it with the other and then putting it back on the, on the island. Uh, so that's my story of my hand, anyway. My feet was also featured as well. Your feet as well? Yeah, yeah, when I was marching around, but I don't remember when, but you know, using your hands to grasp things and press buttons. And we see Penelope's feet um, in the imposters, but she's, they're definitely, well, you have lovely feet, I'm sure, but she's yeah, yeah. Sort of like, <laughs> she's, uh, in, um, in the imposters and she's going through the, the woods of the Jeremiah. But let's go back, let's just go right back to the beginning. Um, what was your first, um, I mean, because it, your first introduction to AP Films was um, a newspaper advert circa just before Stingray when they moved into the new studios. Right. Um, do, do you remember, did you recall watching the programmes on television, the early programmes, like Twizzle, Fourth Ever Falls? Oh, sure, the supercar, actually. It's supercar. Or, or my, my, my age group, I guess. I don't know if it's you, but I think people still watch Supercar now. But, uh, um, oh, yes. yeah. I, so, I started out, uh, I left uh, school at uh, 16, and um, I, I didn't quite know what to do, and uh, so... I've been working as a, a child actor in, in uh, some of the films in Shepperton and Pinewood and Elm Street, and I saw the films being shot, and I, I got an idea that I would like to work in the film industry. And so uh, I went to the labor exchange, and what happened was that the, the guy at the labor exchange said, oh, so you want to work in film? Oh, sure, well, you just have to get into the union, and to get into the union, you have to be a projectionist. So I ended up working as a projectionist at the Granada Cinema, uh, as an apprentice, and I got one day to go up to, to college and learn a bit, little bit more about filmmaking. And when I was a projectionist, the usherette came up to me and said, oh, Peter, there's a job here for working in a film studio, and, uh, and it was AP Films. It was an ad in their local union paper. And so I went up in my bubble car, uh, wearing my Burton suit, which would know, be impressive, of course, and I arrived uh, at AP Film Studios, and I, I was interviewed by Reg Hill, and, uh, and then by Sylvia Anderson, and uh, I was so pleased I got the job. My goodness, I wasn't exactly, you, did, did you, do you remember saying to them how much you watched the programmes um, growing up and all that kind of um, thing? Did you... I think I, I probably did, I can't remember quite what I, what I did, but I, I, I you know, was pretty nervous you know, being interviewed like, like this, and this is like a chance in a lifetime, it seemed, you know, at the time. It and, was. And this would have been, um, um, was work on Stingray, I know it's such a long time ago, but I mean, was work on Stingray already underway? Or what was it, was it, because the studio was brand new at that point, and Stingray was the first um, programme made, made on that premises. Yeah, um, well, uh, I, I guess basically if you walked around the, uh, the studio, you, you know, you see the art department uh, had a kind of open wall, and you saw like a supercar, Still lying, a bunch of big supercar lying up there, uh, and things like that. But I started as a, as a projectionist, um, uh, and, and there was uh, two projectors, and the projectors were double systems, so you had one sound and one picture. And my job, uh, uh, and there's another projectionist called Tony Stacy, who was already there, and he showed me the ropes and how to. How to this is a different kind of projection system, and he he uh, he, he uh, showed me how to lace it and, and stuff like that, but. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the idea was the rushes were shown in the morning, and so the crews would come in, and different crews, you know, the, the, the puppet stage or the, the special effects stage would come in and take a look at their rushes. And we had a, a black and white uh, a TV camera on the actual, in front of the, 
they, they project her, and they would also watch it on uh, on, this, on, on the TV monitor that was in the screening room. And uh, so I did that for a bit, and, and, and also I did back projection. We had this big new German projector, and the projector was uh, lugged around between the two puppet stages, and uh, we used to you know, project the, back of the, the background onto a tracing paper, uh, that uh, if they were in, in, in stingray, you know, underwater, there'd be some underwater uh, plates or things like that, or if they were above. And uh, that's basically how it all began. And then uh, one day the lip sync operator got sick, and uh, I didn't know anything about this lip sync operating business or anything like that. And uh, they said, Oh, Peter, we need you on, 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 on here, we're about to shoot. And so I had to quickly learn how to operate the projection. The, the, the lip sync operation, and I, it was like it was four channels going out to to, to, to different puppets, and so you cue one in when when Scott was talking or when you know another one when Virgil was talking, and I worked in Marina because she didn't talk so I got left <laughs> off there, um, and, and 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 so I, I was able to, to to break up the syllables uh, as they as they as they spoke, and I would do a rehearsal. And when I was looking at script, I would mark down where it, the actual lip sync machine didn't work. And if you know the old tape recorders which had needles, the needles would go up and down. And this is the same thing with a, the with a puppet's mouth, which had a solenoid inside it, and it would go up and down, right? You know, just, just, and sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. You might have noticed it when watching these shows, I don't know, but uh, hopefully not. And so I would break up the syllables and then I would key in the words that didn't, didn't happen. And uh, uh, my, my job as a lip sync operator was not just lip sync operating, it was, uh, uh, it was a, like being an assistant director. Uh, I did script and continuity where I actually marked down you know, which was a good take and which wasn't. And you draw a line between the, you know, the script on the line of the script and you write which take it was. Uh, the continuity such as the screen direction of the puppets, uh, what they were wearing. Uh, any sort of comments and things like that, and then all this would, the script would then go to the editor, who would, you know, review it and see which take the director liked and things like that. It was circled. Um, um, uh, so when I wasn't actually doing the lip sync operating, I was actually um, uh, um, helping build the sets. Um, I would be pushing a dolly. At one time, uh, I have a shot of myself. Um, pushing Scott as he goes into the Thunderbird 1. Uh, that photo actually ended up in a Canadian magazine that I, when I went over to Canada, uh, I, I saw it and I went, my goodness me, this is sort of like, like a premonition of what was to be, right, you know? And that was a picture that was taken by Gary Coxwell, who is a focus puller uh, on, on, on the floor that I was working on. And he was actually a Canadian. And uh, so, Gary and I met back in back in t Toronto. Oh, this is me. <laughs> this is me. Uh, just before I got my bubble car guitar. I used to go and see the Rolling Stones twice a week sometimes, and I like folk music a lot. And I ran a couple of uh, folk music uh, uh, events in Maidenhead here and in Windsor, book booking people like Paul Simon for twenty pounds. <laughs> anyway, this, this is uh, that was my bubble car, uh, and that was like the, the crew would lift it up on the side. And, and give it. So this is the, me as a projectionist being funny, um, and you can see the kind of the, the, the projection, the arc right there, and stuff like that. And this is when I was handsome and stuff like that. And so this is this is a lip sync machine. Uh, these are the hands, and and uh, you can see it going up and down as I'm doing it, right? You know. And along along to the left was this, was a script. And you can, you know, that's the sort of script I would mark up. I wish I had a copy of that script. You don't still have it, Steve? No, no, I wish I did. No, this is see my bad writing. So this is the TV monitor that the director and I would watch and see see what was happening behind from behind the camera. Um, and this is a dolly. This is Alan Perry, Dave Elliott. I don't know who that dude is, but yeah, um, and oh, I've forgotten yeah, the name. Alan Perry. So this is another angle. Um, uh, shooting, shooting from the lip sync machine over there. This is Ian Spurrier over there, who also was a lip -sync, became a lip sync operator on the other stage where David where Elliott was working. And this is me pushing Scott. Scott. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you can see the this Keith up there. Keith, so, Keith Wilson. Yeah, Keith, Keith Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. 
and just made this on my iPad using iMovie. Uh, this is just when I was in London to, a couple of days ago. Yeah. So th this, I was told to pose here by the photographer. <laughs> David Lane. David Lane, Alan Perry. Um, oh, this is Dutch's assignment, isn't it? Um, no, that's after the alligators. Yes, was. Oh yes, that's, that's Christine. And Christine, I I, when I left, you were still writing. We were writing to each other. We knew each other. Um, that's Ian's uh, area. Small puppets. Now, this is the famous... Uh, Attack of the Alligators. Right. <laughs> so you, you were actually in, your, in the wetsuit inside the water, you, in the water, you were saying. Yeah. This is, uh, so, so what happened was is the, the, the puppet stage closed down and we went into special effects. So we got transferred over to work on the special effects. I didn't handle that big one. The <laughs> other ones I handled were much smaller. <laughs> Legend has it that that's a representative from the RS um, PCA who uses holiday time and um, he said, you know, yeah, you want to turn up the voltage, you know, they won't even feel that, you know, give them some proper shock. <laughs> <laughs> so that's me on the right there. Um, that's the thing. man from a life fight. Yeah. So I basically grabbed this off the internet, so I'm glad you can see it. That's me on the right over here, Derek Manning's over there. So this is Thunderbirds Are Go, the, the first feature film. That's right. It's, no, no, I never worked on the feature film. You never? No. Is you there? I don't know what it's called. It's called Crash or something on the... On the, on the it looked like Zero X to me, but um, I could, could be wrong with me. Yeah. I made it so it could kind of like put ah, the ball on. Brink of the So this is me over there, and it's Derek Manning. There's a, that guy there was a camera assistant. Down in, and good, good old Bill Camp. And so that's the last, last of that shot. So that's fantastic. It's great. Yeah. And with that, that shot there with you with Derek and, and Bill Camp, he said you were close with a photographer. Were you meant to look like you were? You were yeah, yeah. Well, sort of like, I, I, yeah. I think I was probably pulled, you know, I was working there and stuff like that. It's all set, set up there. Oh, oh this, is, this is all the great guys, right? You know. And so, you, you yeah, on you? Yeah, yeah. There's Brian over here, right, you know. Um, Ian, if he's around. It's <coughs> Keith there, Brian, yeah. Yeah. There you go. And you have Parker on your shoulder. Yeah, I've got Parker on my shoulder. That was there. And we had, we had the voice of Parker, David Graham, sitting there just a minute ago. So, a wonderful, wonderful stranger. And uh, I found out all this on the internet. So the internet's totally, not totally bad. <laughs> Fantastic. We're so good to hear about these memories, because it, something from talking to all the people who worked in the studio, especially that time, um, there seems to be such a great um, sense of progression. Like, if you worked, as, as you did, you kind of moved up through, through the ranks. You know, you, you started as a projectionist, and suddenly the lip-sync operator had the flu, so you, you jumped into that job. So, um, did, you, did you ever think, because obviously you worked with Stingray and Thunderbirds, and then you you left the company. Did you you left? Did you emigrate? You yes, I left. I, I, I left in '67. Um, arrived in in Toronto May the 24th uh, with a hundred pounds, and uh, within three weeks I got a job at a Canadian broadcasting company as an assistant editor because the directors told me that if you want to be be a director, you have to learn editing. And in fact, uh, Jerry Anderson was an editor as well. He was also a projectionist that I found out on the internet. Uh, so it was kind of, well, it was just kind of nice. Yeah, parallel, parallel. Yeah, parallel. Yeah. Did you ever think if you, if you remained with um, AP Films as they became Century 21, because a lot of your contemporaries um, uh, all became directors. Uh, Ken Turner, for instance, was a special effects technician. And well, Ken Turner, I made contact, and he came to Toronto. I got him an introduction to a big commercial house. He came over and came to my house and things like that. I went to his, his studio, and Ken's commercial work was really lovely. It was really good stuff. He, yeah, built, so he built quite a career, didn't he? He worked with, um, um, with David Mitten and... Um, was it? There's a whole group of people who kind of continues. Even David Lane, he works on lots of them. Um, That's right. Well. Yeah, Alan Perry uh, was a, a director uh, too. And, and yes. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So yeah. So a lot of guys. I could have stayed. You know, what was happening was that the studios would close down for a few months of the year, and uh, and then I'd have to figure out well how do you earn a, earn a living, and then at one time a lot of, a lot of some of the guys in special effects went over and worked on 2001. And I almost like made my leap just to just to go and help help those guys, but it was only ten weeks' work or something. I was like, you know, 
I was really unsure about making a living and keeping alive, you know. It is always fascinating because, I mean, to us looking back many years, um, many years after the event, it seems almost like a production line by you. There must have been like a um, fallow period between Stingray and Thunderbirds and between Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't completely constant. Yeah. No, it wasn't. No. Um, so it was. It was kind of. It was always kind of like I actually went down to Swanage, and uh, I, I got a few odd jobs and things like that, and just just hang out down there, which is kind of a lovely place to hang out. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm originally from Surbiton or Ditton Hill, um, so I used to used to commute in my bubble car. Uh, through Windsor, and I just went to I just went to Windsor Castle uh, yesterday to see where, and I saw where I used to drive through every day, you know. And then I moved up to Maidenhead and uh, worked a little, little closer. Uh, That's great. I mean, what a time though! It must it must have been such a. I mean, South Trading Estate was um, a hype of activity at the Mars Bar Factory, and the actual studio faced the, the big. Um, had its own power station, the Star Trading Estate, these big cooling towers there. It still has its own kind of power station that powers it all. Yeah. You must have kind of... Did, I mean, Sylvia um, came here and talked to us at our last convention because she passed away, sadly. And um, it was great. She was talking about in between productions at um, AP Films. She was, you know, doing cleaning at the Mars Bar factory, all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I remember that uh, we used to go play, have lunchtime and we would play soccer with some of the Mars Bar uh, guys. Uh, out, out, was it was an V Mars Bar. V Mars Bar, yeah. What was your position? Were you, were you kind of... I, I, th I was goalie because I didn't like to run a lot, so... <laughs> so I'm playing with Diana, so a long time. Do you remember going to school? So they, did the APF boys <laughs> they had to feed the Mars Bar crew? Well, I don't know. I, 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 we never got free Mars Bars either, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I tell you a couple of things that we, we used to go out to the pub every so often. And I remember Des being really upset with us because we came about a little bit tipsy, right, you know. And I think all of a sudden that was a motivation for the management to set up a whole new canteen. Well, we didn't have a canteen, actually. We had a tea lady who would come around with a nice tray. And she was a, a lovely tea lady. I mean, was, uh, but the, the canteen was all modern. I remember seeing it being so impressed that you could actually microwave the food, right, you know. Um, but, and then I saw the studio the additional studios being built after that and uh, yeah the extra units because you can you say you left just before production on the feature film started um, um yeah I, I believe it was I, I, I can't remember whether it was a feature film or it was Terror Hawk I, I it was well, the, um, Ter Terror Hawk was um, much much later in the early 80s that's from the that Bray but um T oh Terror Hawk Terror Ter Ter Hawk yeah that was, that was Jerry did that on his own back um about ten years after after AP film Century Twenty One. Oh, okay, okay. But, um, it would have been Captain Scarlet was the next series. So you went, I mean Captain Scarlet. Yes, Scarlet. that's it, right? Yes, which I saw the first time last night. I've never seen it. You know. It is, it, I mean, what do you make of it? Because it's a completely different scale of puppetry compared to. I, I noticed the heads were very small. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it, yeah, it was, it was like a non-stop action, right? You know, and I think yeah. that's what you know, I mean. I think that was Derek Meddings and Brian Johnson's <laughs> legacy. They like to blow things up, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any kind of health and safety um, memories of you know things you never get away with today? Oh, oh, I'm so glad you asked me about that. <laughs> um, being a bit of a lazy person. Um, I, I'm, one of my jobs was to create rain, and so we used to have these garden pressure things that you said put down. I got so fed up pressing it down and pressing it down, and so I decided to put a bit of dry ice inside there and close it up because it would expand and I wouldn't have to pump or anything. But it happened, it happened really quick, and all of a sudden there's this loud whistle coming from the valve, and everybody scattered, right? You know? uh, and uh, I, I, I remember sort of thinking, I've done something wrong. You know? <laughs> and, and anyway, it, it was okay. We all lived to tell a tale. Uh, but the, 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 you know, I don't know whether uh, anybody here remembers what I did, but uh, now they know I did it. You know, but um, there was another time where I remember there was a little, there was, a, there was like, there was so much. Well, um, camaraderie and fun in, in working at, at AP Films. Um, I, I, we all used to have to wear ties and, 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 and would look really proper, right? You know, it's sort of like, not like the film crews today where you just wear a t shirt, you know? And so, uh, the, 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 some of the jokes that were, play, were, were played around was I remember uh, the electrician used to always have to take a break after putting up the lights, and these were real big bright lights and sometimes it used to get quite hot, I think it was 10k, right, you know, 
and, and, and I remember the electrician suddenly there was a sort of a puff of smoke a little explosion underneath his seat waking you up you know and you sort of like, like look, look like that so, so there was a little there's always something going on that you had to keep fairly your eyes open to see what people were doing you know um, I, I think some of the work was, 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 was fairly dangerous I would say I think they had a few fires and things like that in the special effects uh, um, but uh, I think overall working with the, the actual film crew um, uh, it was a lovely experience I mean, and it's so nice for me to come back and, and, and try to explain what I was seeing and what I was feeling about, about, about the people there it was like the beginning of my life I was at my turning point of my life that, that set me up uh, to be a filmmaker and if it wasn't for then I don't know what I would have done I would have washed dishes or something you know. Um, but it just, it just really uh, brought me together. It, it taught me all about, uh, you know, shooting. I used to use uh, the, the, the film outs and, and put it into a stills camera because uh, you, know, you got it for free and you used to go off and take, take stills with it. Um, everybody was sharing, uh, though the union situation was kind of weird because, you know, if you're in a union, uh, if, you, if you're not in a union, you can't get a job. It's sort of like it was very hard to get into the union. But I was able to get into the union because I was a lip sync operator, and I think there's only about three or four people in the world that have a union card saying lip sync operator. It's fantastic. And you say, as you say, it informs your, your career afterwards. I guess working at APF, working all those different disciplines, uh, gave you like such a kind of broad knowledge of the industry. So when you when you emigrated, you must have had. Um, you went to editing, you say. Yeah, because your interview must have gone very smoothly because you've done all these things. Yeah, I made my first. I made my first film, my first short film, uh, and uh, to the music of Procol Harum. And the actual Procol Harum came to, to my little apartment and looked at the film when I was making it, and uh, it got aired on CBC. And uh, I, I, I guess the the some of the things that I learned in AP films, like special effects, I actually did underwater um, submarine for the, for the Department of National Defense in, in Ottawa. So, because they were trying to figure out how to shoot a submarine underwater. And I said, well, I, I know how to do that, right? You know, so you, <laughs> we, had a, we had a tank and, you know, you can actually push a light down. I remember all this, so pushing a light down into the water and then just rippling it, you get these lovely rays coming out and things like that, which makes it look really good. But those sort of all those sorts of little details came came to mind, um, and uh, I mean I, I, I've gone through the whole bit where I've actually this is when I'm sort of like having an ego trip right now, you know, when I'm talking about myself. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I I, I ended up um, uh, becoming a documentary filmmaker, and that means that I was actually a cinematographer and an editor and a director and a producer, and I do the quotes and 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 do the scripts and things like that. And I work with the National Film for the National Film Board uh, um, in Canada. Um, I, I, I was working in Ottawa, m making sort of like these kind of, I, I don't know, they were kind of like propaganda films sometimes for the government and things like that, you know. Um, I made one film for the changing of the guards and how to be a changing, you know, how to do the whole process. And, and so I, <laughs> I went, I went to Windsor to, to tell a look to see how they did it, right? You know, but it is, of course, they're real army uh, guys, right? But uh, in, in Ottawa, they're the students. And so I was making those kinds of little independent films. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I got talking with a guy who was going down uh, to California. And uh, I said, well, I, I wouldn't mind going down to California because that's where they make movies. And so I had uh, a, a three, uh, two kids that were three years old. And I went down to LA and ended up working as a, as a picture editor and a sound editor uh, on, on some features you might have heard of. I was a sound editor on... Uh, uh, the Hills of Eyes uh, with Wes Craven and uh, there was another picture called uh, Raw uh, that was uh, a, a, like probably the, the most expensive low budget expensive uh, home movie uh, made in Hollywood and the producer of it was Noah Marshall who produced The Exorcist and uh, his wife was Tippi Hedren uh, who was in The Birds and the director of photography was Jan de Bon, who, who I worked side by side editing on a three-headed, picture-headed cam. I'm not getting too technical. Um, and, uh, and so I was sort of doing that kind of work. And then I, I was a supervising editor on a TV series um, called Camp Wilderness for Kids. Great that I was working on kids again. And uh, this is, this is a, they, they, I ended up going off and shooting and directing some of those series. And they were sort of like, 
go up into into the wilderness, and uh, I'd have to uh, write write the script as I was going along. And we'd make it like a Walt Disney type, where they would, I'd get them to say a few lines, and then we would re, we rewrote. Actually, I'd do the initial writing in a in the uh, in the edited session, so that the the, we could add the voices to them when we figured out what the hell we were doing. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, so my kids were five and I came back to Toronto and I ended up working in Toronto. And I've, I've sort of, um, I've made a, I've worked for educational television uh, and uh, another, another series I worked on was called Thrill of a Lifetime, which you probably have, haven't even heard of, but uh, it was like people would write in and, and ask for th their thrills to be succeeded and I would film it right and they, you know one, one throw was a guy who wanted to ride a buffalo in a Calgary stampede and things like that you know so this is this is the thrills you know the health and safety front line yeah, you have to you have to get off within sort of like 12 seconds otherwise the herd starts charging each other and you know I thought this is so scary I can't do this anymore but I ended up doing TV commercials and I did a couple of low budget independent uh, dramas and uh, I, I, I was out, out of work actually, and one time I ended up uh, writing uh, a, a, a proposal about how to make video when video was first coming out. And that ended up uh, being on PBS and on a learning channel in England. So I've done it, I've sort of gone the whole gamut, but I've never, never gone back into being into the big feature film business, but I've made a living. It's so wonderful to hear that. It's yeah, great. It's yeah. I mean, did, did, I mean, obviously, the Anderson programs were broadcast all over the world. Did, did, did you ever show your children the episode where you, you held Lady Penelope's um, glass? We, it, it wasn't broadcast in Canada, and it still it's isn't broadcast in Canada. That's, it, I mean, you, you know, I, I bought the, the sets and things like that, um, but uh, uh, you can buy it on iPhones over there, on, on iTunes, rather. Uh, but no, it, it was never, 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 never transmitted. Uh, and and um, funny enough, I was getting a pair of running shoes uh, for the trip, so I had to walk around London. And uh, I was telling the guy, I'm, I, I'm coming over to England to work on, uh, uh, to, to talk about Thunderbirds. And the guy said, Thunderbirds? And he actually had the International Rescue Badge <laughs> <laughs> on there. I couldn't I believe it, right? You know? And I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing a screenplay right now, and I, I belong to this, this, uh, this group on Facebook, and we had a meeting, and I just casually said, well, I worked on Thunderbirds, and then all of a sudden, all people are coming around and talking to me. I never realized that people do know about it in Canada, you know, so, they, you know. Word, word did get out. Word, word did get out. Somehow they did watch it, but I, I didn't, maybe, I don't know, I never was aware it was on, on TV over there. That's a shame. Well, they missed out, didn't they? But um, yeah. well, in a moment, I'll be opening up the floor if anyone's got any questions for Peter. Um, I, su I suppose well, one, one thing I really must ask you about is um, it was a lip sync operator was ill, um, so you had to do some lip syncing. Um, what, what, what kind of got you um, the, the gig to be Lady Penelope's hands and to and to push Scott Tracy on the, on the set? Uh, and, uh, well, my hand. Yeah, hands look, look at him, you know. But, um, <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I, I think it was like a standard thing where the lip sync operator was obviously not working and that he had a spare thing. He couldn't ask a camera operator to do it, right, you know. And, and so, yeah, so I was always the, the guy to do that, you know. And, uh, Literally all hands to the pumps. Yeah, all, all, all hands yeah. to the puppet, yeah. I never got, you know, a credit, you know, this is my hand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure we can amend that now, can't we? That's right, yeah, so now it's on Facebook, right, you know, so... <laughs> Right, do you have any questions for Peter? We have a microphone um, down here. Was the lady here? Did you have a question at all? No? No? Well, I, I, I feel terribly greedy. I mean, that's a, I think yeah. we can change it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, this is... Here we go. Yes, sir. Oh, hi. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you worked on Raw with... Um, Noel Marshall's production with Jean de Bond. Um, any particular memories of that? Because I've heard it's quite an interesting production history. Uh, yeah, uh, well, as, as an editor, well, no, actually, there's lots of stories. Um, uh, I remember uh, cutting a scene with, with Noel Marshall, who was with all these lions on a staircase, and this stupid bloke. Um, he, he, he did 38 takes, <laughs> and all these lines all around him, he, you know, and he couldn't quite get it right. And then all of a sudden, a lion 
bit him in a leg, right, you know, and he had to go to hospital. So he was in hospital at the same time it happened. He lived on Soledad Canyon, uh, where, I, where I went out to visit, and, and his, he had all this, like a zoo out there, and uh, uh, it got flooded. And so he heard about this, all the animals, you know, escaping and things like that. And then he came out and, and, and started to uh, wrestle with a black panther with a chain, and the chain got around his leg, and I think it helped fix his leg. That's, that's the story, that's the story I, I know about Raw. But it just got released out last year in North America. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Oh, that gentleman just there. <coughs> Thanks very much indeed. Um, what was your most challenging moment uh, when working on Stingray or Thunderbirds? What, what real uh, particular stands out for you? Uh, well, of course, like just going in and just trying to understand the equipment. Uh, this is all new, new, new projectors I had to learn. Um, I didn't understand the idea that you know the projectors had to the front the. the the rear projection had to sync up with the camera so that the camera, you wouldn't see the lines and things like that. There was all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I think the lip syncing was a real challenge because I thought if I blow this right, you know, uh, they'll really know I'm stupid. Um, uh, I, um, uh, I, I, th I think, I, I, yeah, I think the lip sync, you're getting that job as a lip sync operator and everything kind of went fairly smoothly. I, you know, I ended up working with all the directors, uh, Alan, Alan Patillo, uh, Des Saunders, uh, Dave Elliott, uh, Dave, uh, John Kelly, and then Dave Lane later uh, came on. And, uh, and in fact, um, uh, John Kelly came over to Toronto, uh, and I met him over, over in Toronto. And he was he ended up working over there, and there was also another sound editor that worked in in Toronto as well. But the challenging moments, yeah, I just I just think that there was probably if if I could really remember the special effects. I know. We worked 35 hours in, in one stretch to meet the air, air date, and it was extremely, um, t it was t very, very hard work and, and tiring, and it, and it was, you know, it, that was that was the toughest, toughest time uh, that I met. So I think that's what I can think of right now. <laughs> well, Peter, thank you very much for this morning. Um, okay. Sadly, we're out of time now, but you're back tomorrow at 11.45 with, with Brian Johnson. Which um, is a, a legend to me. I mean, it's, it's just, just, just wonderful. <coughs> I think you, know, you two can share some memories tomorrow morning at 11.45, but let's um, give Peter a round of applause for you.